of Germany. Welcome. Anthony Blinken, Secretary of State, the US. Nice to have you. And Subramanian uh, Jaishankar, Minister of External Affairs, Republic of India. Minister. I hope uh, that based on uh, the topic of the session that you will not all agree with each other and we can have some, some sparks. Uh, we, we have about 43 minutes and I will prepare your questions because um, I'll ask a few questions and then I'll turn to, to the audience. Minister Baerbock, I'm going to start with you. Um, Germany's national security strategy calls for expanding global partnerships. Um, and is quite open about the multipolarity of, of, the, of the world today. H how do you go about it at a time when there are so many divisions, and particularly when increasingly we feel the global south and the Western world are not on the same page? Well, first of all, uh, good afternoon. Very good to, to have this important uh, session with my dear colleagues. In a nutshell, it's more important than ever because uh, we are not naive. Obviously, they are ruthless actors who don't want to, to grab up the title of our panel and negotiate the slice of the pie, but they want to rob the whole bakery. And uh, having that uh, in, in mind, uh, I believe it's uh, even more important than ever that those who are at the table negotiating about the slices of the pie stay there, first of all, resolute, respectfully, and also reflective. And this is the core also of our national security strategy, which we have drafted as the German government, making very clear in the light uh, of this ruthless war of aggression against Ukraine that we are resolute in defending international law. It's the best protection for everybody around the world. So there is no question about negotiating whether Ukraine has right of self-defense or not. We all agreed, and not only I don't like that word, but Western actors, we all agreed in our Charter of the United Nations, there is the right of self-defense, and we all agreed on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Having said that, obviously, we have to be respectful that especially within Ukraine, and I think this is the lesson we have learned, and it was very important to speak to partners like India and so many around the world, Brazil, um, South Africa, we have to be respectful that obviously in this moment when we said we need the whole international security, others asked some questions like, where have you been when we needed you? Or asked some question, so um, actually what does it mean for the future? Do you also stand with us? And this is, I would say, maybe something new in the attitude, at least from our uh, foreign politics uh, from, from, from Europe, to say, OK, we cannot take for granted that everybody just agrees with our European or transatlantic uh, vision. And the third part, I think it's the most easy, but it's the strongest asset for democracies. The strength of democracy, in my point of view, is that we be, can be self-reflective and self-critical. So asking in a moment when others for example, war of aggression, we're not saying automatically, okay, we support you, not saying, why don't you get it, but asking ourselves why they cannot support us. And I think this is the critical part, but the most powerful part. And at least, again, in our national security strategy, we try to do it, talking about, for example, our colonialism past. Understanding why South Africa was mentioning the whole time their ties with Russia in the apartheid regime. And being self-critical and saying, oh yeah, not all democracies have stood back in time at their time. And taking that as something where we said, yes, we might have made mistakes in the past, but we cannot change the past, we can only change the future together. I think this is the strength of multilateralism, and we see around the world the majority believes in it. 
Do you find that increasingly people are questioning more when it comes to, let's stick to Ukraine and, and we'll, we'll get to, um, to Gaza in a minute, but on Ukraine, are people coming round to your point of view or are they distancing themselves more? Well, to see it over the last two years, I mean, we've seen the 142 voting in the general uh, assembly, so it is a majority of states, because most of the countries in the world, like mine, we're not the biggest country in the world. We don't have the biggest military means. And this is for most of the countries. They know that uh, the Charter of the United Nations, uh, the rule of law is their life insurance. So we see this big majority there. We see also the support. Many have traveled, and I think this is really important to give always the question of uh, war of aggression, a human face. It was not that we con convinced uh, some other actors in the world by saying, now you have to stand with us. But when delegation traveled uh, to Kiev, and not only Kiev, to Butcher, to Irpin, when they spoke, like we did, to the parents of those where their child had been kidnapped by Russia, then we give this situation a human face, and that's all about. And this is why it's so important to not only talk about state, but we talk about the people, talk about also the question of the rule of law in front of the International Criminal Court, for example, bringing crimes against humanity in front of uh, the court. And there we see again the majority of the states is pushing for that one. Um, Secretary Blinken, uh, th there is a there's a feeling that um, it's it's more than a feeling. It's what we see on uh, happening on the ground that the U.S.-China tensions are leading to greater fragmentation, and that you're almost competing for you know alliances. Who's you know who's our ally? And we we see this within within the UN and various UN institutions, uh, but we just see it all all around uh, the globe. To what extent do you feel that you, you are challenged in your, in your travels around the world on the fundamental uh, questions? Well, first, it's wonderful to be with my, my friends, wonderful to be back uh, in Munich at the security conference, known uh, among all of us as speed dating for diplomats. Uh, but we, um, we've done a couple of things, and I'll come quickly to your question. Um, from the start of this administration, We've made an investment, a reinvestment, in our alliances, in our partnerships, and in the multilateral system. Uh, we've reinvested, we've reengaged, we've tried to rejuvenate, we've even reimagined. And the reason for that is simple. It's because it's in our interest to do it. Not a single one of the challenges that we have to face and that are so important to the interests of the American people can we effectively deal with uh, alone, as powerful and as resourceful uh, as we are. Uh, and so across the board, We've seen our comparative advantage as having a strong network of voluntary alliances, voluntary partnerships. And if you're not at the table in the international system, you're going to be on the menu. So it was very important for us to re-engage multilaterally, and we've done that. When it comes to strategic competition, and there's no doubt that we have one with China, there are a few things to be said. First, we have an obligation to manage that relationship responsibly. And I think that's something that we hear from countries around the world, and it's clearly an interest to do so. And that's exactly what President Biden is doing. And when it comes to other countries, the point is not to say to country X, Y, or Z, you have to choose. The point is to offer a good choice. And if we can do that, uh, and I believe we can and we have and will continue, uh, then I think uh, the choice becomes fairly self-evident. Um, over the last six or seven months, um, we have engaged in a sustainable way with, uh, with China. I just met my counterpart Wang Yi here in Munich, uh, but that follows a series of, uh, of meetings, notably, most importantly, President Biden and, and President Xi. Uh, and I think we brought greater stability to the relationship, uh, not uh, moving away from or ignoring the fact that, yes, we have a competition, there are areas where we are contesting each other, but there are also areas where we can and should cooperate because it's in our interest uh, to do that. One of the best examples of that is the agreement we reached with China on fentanyl, the single largest, the number one killer, number one killer of Americans aged 18 to 49 is a synthetic opioid, fentanyl. Now we have meaningful cooperation from and with China on fentanyl. That's going to make a difference 
in the lives of Americans. And, and you think it is sustainable to have cooperation on, in some areas, mm -hmm. climate uh, be, being one of them, but to have a strategic competition, the strategic competition mm -hmm. that defines geopolitics today and that will go on for a, a, very, a very long time, do you think that that is sustainable, that both sides sort of can find rules of engagement? This is where we compete and this is where we cooperate? Some, some fundamentals haven't changed. Countries will act in their self-interest. Uh, where we have to compete, we will. Where we have to contest, we will. Where it makes sense to cooperate, we will. And I think you can do uh, all of the above at the same time. But there's something else that's, um, I think, changed, and it goes back to the first part of the, the question. The very fact that we've re-engaged and rejuvenated, as well as reimagined some of our alliances and partnerships, along with the investments that we've made at home, in the United States, the investments we've made in our infrastructure, the investments we've made in science and technology and chips, the, the, the building blocks of the 21st century economy, the investments we've made in climate technology. You put those two things together, investments at home, much greater alignment with partners and allies across the board in Europe, in the Indo-Pacific, uh, in Asia, on how to approach a question as complicated as relations with China. That puts us in a position of much greater strength in dealing with all of the challenges that we have to deal with. Uh, Minister Jay Shankar, India has more of a uh, multiple choice mindset. Is, would, that be, would that be right? Um, from non-alignment to, I think you may have called it, or somebody else called it, all alignment. So you can pick and choose alliances, but you can also pick and choose topics. On Russia, for example, you still buy uh, Russian oil. Uh, is, that, is that okay with your uh, counterpart from the US? Everything is, your, your relationship is fine. You can do whatever you want, whenever you want. Uh, okay, first of all. Uh, I mean, you're sitting next to each other. No, no, so. first of all, uh, delighted uh, to be here. Uh, and I couldn't find a better set of people to be with on the stage. Uh, so thank you for whoever put us all together. Uh, your question, uh, do we have multiple options? Answer is yes. Uh, is that a problem? Why should it be a problem? If I'm smart enough to have multiple options, you should be admiring me. You know, you shouldn't be criticizing. <laughs> now, is, is that a problem for other people? I don't think so. I don't think so, certainly in this case uh, and in that case, because look, uh, we try to explain what are the different pulls and pressures which countries have. And uh, it's very hard to have a unidimensional relationship. Now, again, different countries and different relationships have different histories. If I were to look, say, between the US and Germany, uh, it is rooted, you know, there's an alliance uh, nature to it. Uh, there's a certain uh, history on which that relationship is grounded. In our case, it's very different. So uh, I don't want you to even inadvertently uh, give the impression that we are purely and, you know, unsentimentally transactional. We are not. Uh, you know, we get along with people. We believe in things. We share things. We agree on some things, but uh, you know there are times when uh, you know when you're located in different places, have different levels of development, uh, different uh, uh, experiences. All of that uh, gets into it. So life is complicated. Life is differentiated, and I think it's very important today not to reduce the entire complexity of our world into very sweeping propositions. Yeah. I think that era is today behind us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I agree very much with what Tony said, which is uh, good partners provide choices. Smart partners take some of those choices. Uh, but sometimes <laughs> there will be choices on which you say, well, you know, I think I'll pass up on that one. That's a very good point, um, which brings me to uh, the BRICS and the rise of middle powers, because that is one of, uh, of the shifts that we see today. Do, to what extent do you think that that is a challenge to the West, or maybe that can be sort of the bridge, especially in a world where we will see continued competition between the US and China? And 
I'm going to ask Minister Jai okay. Shankar first, and, but I'd love for both of you to come no, as well. I, I thought maybe the BRICS one, you wanted the US. I, after you, Jack, please. Uh, but uh, look, uh, I, again, I think it's important to go back to how it began. The BRICS started in an era where Western dominance was very strong. Uh, the pre 